I would say that uh, most of us are familiar with a verse in Hebrews 11.4. We're not going to go to it right now. Well, we can. Let's go to Hebrews 11.4. Nothing like being organized. Hebrews 11.4. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. I was this far away from saying, well, you know, uh, what Nina said was close to what my message is about, but she's not dead. So I thought it might be inappropriate to apply it to her. But people are noticing. Like she said, boy, I don't know if my daughter would remember those things. Well, she's quoting back to her the things that she told her. And a lot of times, you're having a much greater effect than you could possibly realize. Now, he being dead yet speaketh, who knows how many messages have been preached with this very title and how many different directions it's gone. But that's the title of the message tonight. It might go a different direction. It was a man by the name of Alex Haley who authored the book Roots, the saga of an American family, and of course they made it into a TV series back in the 70s. And he traced his roots, Alex Haley did, a black man, back to a man by the name of Kunta Kinte, who was kidnapped in Gambia, Africa in 1767 and taken to Maryland where he was sold as a slave. That was the story of the roots of Alex Haley. My roots, if I may be so presumptuous tonight, go back to a man by the name of Man Warren Beale. M-A-N-N-W-A-R-R-E-N. Man Warren Beale. And he was the first settler of Beale's Island, Maine, 31 years before Kunta Kinte came to Maryland. Man Warren Beale was my great-great-great-grandfather. Now, those are my physical roots. And when our family goes on vacation to the home of my progenitors, I reflect upon those things, I suppose, quite naturally. It's a physical thing. Those are my physical roots, but there's a spiritual thing as well. And that has its genesis, if you will, in my heart. Pastor George Wooded. I don't even know where he was born. Uh, but... He is a pastor down there in Beals Island, Beals, Maine. And Buddy Franklin of Bangor, Maine, but he came from Eastport, Maine, where my grandfather, David Mitchell, hailed, hailed from. But uh, those are spiritual progenitors, if you will, and followed by others. But the bulk of my spiritual life has been right here at Pioneer Baptist. 13 years P.C., before Pioneer Baptist, and 25 years at Pioneer Baptist. So two-thirds of my spiritual life has been right here, right here in this church. We don't always think about that kind of thing. You know, we look at the calendar and say, hey, wait a minute. You know, this is where it's been for me. This has been my spiritual life. Spiritual roots might be one place, and spiritual life might be in another place. A lot of people were born physically somewhere and hardly ever been there again. I lived in Machias for three years before my dad moved to uh, Auburn, Maine. I was born in Machias at Dr. Hansen's Hospital. Lived a uh, door away at 8 Cooper Street. My dad sold a house, and they moved down to Auburn, Maine to get work. And I went back there for college for four years, and I now have a place in Jonesport where my dad was born. But spiritual roots may be one thing. Spiritual life may be another thing. Again, Spiritually, Pioneer Baptist is my home. And I would say, and I want to be careful saying this, but I would say that spirituality trumps, if I may use the word trump here, phys physicality every time. Spirituality trumps physicality every time. Much like we say sometimes, rock crushes scissors every time. But sometimes the two intersect. So, hey, here are my physical roots, here are my spiritual roots. But sometimes they intersect. 
and certainly they would in this church with uh, many of us, our children, uh, physical children, but they've also been born again. And when the two intersect, it makes that roots thing infinitely and eternally more engaging. My brother have a, has on his wall at his cottage in Jonesport a cover page that came out of Man Warren Beale's Bible. So that guy that settled Beale's in 17-whatever, 36, 46, whatever it was, out of the, the Bible somehow, through my Aunt Cassie, I believe, he's got that page, and he framed it and put it on his wall. And I think for historical reasons, but I get a kick out of it spiritually. I'm going to quote to you what it says. <clears throat> Man Warren Beale, his book. I like that. On one of the covers of my Bible, I had my Bible. Now, that's a couple Bibles ago, and whatever was written on it is worn off. But Man Warren Beale, his book. Moose Peak Reach, June 24th, 1791. Intended by him to be continually in the possession of his family for their soul's instructor, by and with the power of God, so instructing as he, in his wisdom, may see for air to instruct, rule, and govern for the glory of his holy name. That's on my brother's wall from Man Warren Beale, my great-great-great-grandfather, who was the first settler of Beale's Island. Nice roots. Well, all of Beale was Marin Warren's daughter, and she was the first white woman born on Beale's Island. And she married a man, man by the name of Joseph Kelly on March 17, 1802. And Joseph Kelly is buried in a little family plot, along with others of my family, on Kelly's Point. That's out in Jonesport, right across uh, the reach. Uh, what he said was Musa Peak is now called the Musa Beck Reach. Go across there, they moved over to Jonesport to Kelly's Point, and that little cemetery is on the same property where my dad was born. Born in a house on Kelly's Point. Now the cemetery lies in the condition of the slothful man's field of Proverbs 24, which is, I think, illegal, by the way. I believe if you've got a cemetery, you're supposed to keep it maintained and, and accessible, but this place is a mess, okay? I've been out there, I've looked at the gravestones, uh, my, my relatives are buried there. Even one of my father's brothers, I believe, was buried there. But then much of the family in the other cemetery in Jonesport where I once worked, and uh, which is in good condition. But this is one of those little family plots. And uh, this guy that uh, my dad had to sign off on the property for him to get it. And he has not maintained it. And I don't think he likes people going on there. I've been on there. My brother has researched it. I've been out there and dug through the bushes and found tombstones and things, and uh, there it is. But if you can get on that property right now and look around and search around, you can still find Joseph Kelly's tombstone. And if you find it, here's what you'll find written on it. For I know that my Redeemer liveth. I have uh, a Bible here that I think was Joseph Kelly's, right here. Now, I don't know. It couldn't have been his. It's 1849. Somebody short of, short of that uh, got the Bible. They got a family page in here, and they got dates and marriages of Olive Beale and all of those things. And uh, if I looked around into the middle of it long enough, I would find those pages that are written down. But there's an old Bible. And you know what? Since I don't expect to preach long, I would like to read a verse out of this Bible. 1 John five, seven, and eight. Maybe two. Now, I'm not going to say anything about these verses. There's a picture of some old guys. I wonder who they are. Uh, 1 John 5, 7, and 8. And then maybe one more, without comment. 1 John 5, 7, 8. You can read along with me in your Bible. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. I like that. I think I'll read uh, Isaiah 14 as well. This is, I guess, my great-great-grandfather's Bible.
I'm going to read verse 12, just picking a verse. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? Right there. You know, he still knew who Lucifer was. Still knew what they were writing about. Didn't that get, didn't that get, uh, didn't get confused with any title of Christ over there. Amen? Well, I like that, and I'm moving on. Well, that cemetery where Joseph Kelly was born, on the tombstone is inscribed, for I know that my Redeemer liveth. Several years ago, my Aunt Cassie, my father's sister, she's in heaven now, she asked me what that meant. I explained it to the best of my ability. Several days ago, my brother asked me the very same thing. Once again, I explained it. One thing it means is this. Joseph Kelly, just like Mary Warren Beale, being dead is still speaking. And I'm going to talk tonight a little bit about what he's saying. He said, I know that my Redeemer liveth in Job chapter 19. Job chapter 19. Job chapter 19, verses 23 through 27. Oh, that my words, now Job is writing, under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. Job 19, verse 23. Oh, that my words were now written. Oh, that they were printed in a book. What a thing that they are written. Amen? That they are printed in a book, in a book that God says, boy, I'll tell you, he'll preserve it from this generation forever. Amen? Isn't that a wonderful thing? His words are in a book, and guess what? So are Joseph Kelly's, in a manner of speaking. They're written in stone. Look at what he says. Oh, that my words were now, were, were now written. Oh, that they were printed in a book, that they were graven with an iron pen and lead in the rock forever. Joseph Kelly. Those words written on his stone, and it's going to take a long time for those to wear off if you can fight your way through to them. You know, I think it's sometimes a little bit like the gospel. It's written right there. It's preserved forever, but people never see it. They don't want to kick through the weeds and get through the problems that they have to to, to get to it. But boy, it's there, and it means everything. I know that my Redeemer liveth. Job's words are written in a book, and Joseph's are written on stone and in my heart. Secondly, verse 25. He being dead yet speaketh. What is Joseph Kelly saying? Verse 25. For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. The Lord is coming back. We're not going over to Zechariah 14. We don't have to go to the New Testament to see how many times Jesus said he was coming back, but he is coming back. And Job knew that. <clears throat> and guess what? So did Joseph Kelly. That song that uh, Mac Evans used to sing, I got five tapes of Mac Evans that I found in a little building on a, a property back there, never unwrapped, five cassette tapes, or as Parker Daly used to call them, cassette tapes. I guess that's a Missouri pronunciation, Dr. Smith. And uh, one of the songs he, he used to sing had, well, I don't even know if he did sing, to sing this one, but somebody did. I've been to Calvary through the witness of his word. Well, look. We've been there through the witness of his word. We say what he said. The Lord is coming back again. And we're going to have a new body, verses 26 and 27. <clears throat> and though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. We are going to have another body. This is not just a pipe dream. This is reality. Whom I shall see for myself and mine eye shall behold. And not another, though my reins be consumed within me. Boy, Job knew some things that people don't know today. They don't know them in the seminaries today. And Job knew that stuff. I like it. And I think of Second Corinthians, for we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were destroyed, we have a building of God and a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. So first thing, he being dead yet speaketh. What is, what is Joseph Kelly saying to me? Because he's quoted Job. 
And because he quoted Job, I'm going to figure he knew what Job was talking about, and that's what I'm going to talk about for the next 10 or 12 minutes. If Joseph Kelly was saying what Job said. And Joseph Kelly knew what Job said. He's telling me that as a Christian, I know some things. Amen? You know, we always used to say we don't have a hope so salvation. we got a no-so salvation. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. Joseph Kelly knew that stuff. And he being dead, yet speaketh. What's in your background, I wonder? And well, man, I got saved. Listen, I don't know what they know. You never heard me preach that these guys up in heaven are peering over the battlements of heaven looking down upon us. I never preach that. Okay? I don't preach that. But we have a witness. We'll say, if Joseph Kelly's not watching me today over the battlements of glory, what is the witness? He left the witness on his tombstone. He left a testimony. Boy, we've uh, written in the kids' Bibles. I got stuff written in their Bibles about Jesus Christ and being born again and what I believed. And among them, I've always written in the children's and the grandchildren's that we've written. This is the Word of God. Many men will claim otherwise, but yet it remains the written Word of God. Joseph Kelly knew some things. Those are my roots, and he being dead, that's one of the things he's saying. Now, another thing he's saying is in Job chapter 9. Job chapter 9. Verse 32. For he, God, is not a man as I am, that I should answer him, and we should come together in judgment. How am I going to go together, you know, go with God with judgment? How do I stand before God and say, well, hey, listen, God, I think you made a mistake here. Right? Oh, you're not judging me correctly here. Job says, he's not a man as I am, that I should answer him, and we should come together in judgment. Neither is there any daysman betwixt us that might lay his hand upon us both. He said, I don't have a daysman. I can't go in there with an arbitrator or a mediator. There isn't one. He's longing for that daysman, isn't he? He's longing for that mediator. He's longing for that arbitrator. If you would like to hold your place, maybe, or not, and go over to 1 Timothy. We know very well these verses. Some faiths seem to get confused on them for whatever reason, probably because they don't believe the Bible in the first place. But 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. We'll begin at verse 4 who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. 2 Timothy, excuse me, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4. Who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. One thing I believe, by extension, that Joseph Kelly is saying to me is this. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. He would have all men to be saved. Christ is pleasantly disposed toward all men. Job is looking for a daysman, somebody to mediate between him, and obviously he'd like that guy to be favorable to him. Wouldn't he? And here is Christ, who would have all men to be saved. He loves us all. Verse 5, for there is one mediator, one God and one mediator between man and God, the man Christ Jesus. Christ is that mediator for all men. He is that daysman that we're looking for. And in verse 6, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Now what's Job saying? Job is saying in chapter 9, Neither is there any daysman betwixt us. He's looking. He's looking. He's saying there has to be a daysman. There has to be a, a mediator. And really, what it's saying to me is that I should appreciate my dispensational position, if you will, because I am not on this one. I might be on some things when it gets to prophecy and things, 
But listen, I'm not seeing through a glass darkly on this one. God has very clearly told me that I have a daysman redeemer. Amen? He loves me. He came looking for me. When I put my trust in him, I had him that he could lay his hand between God and man because he is God and he is man. And he can mediate. And he can be there on my behalf. And I thank God that I can see clearly what Joseph Kelly was crying out for. And Job was crying out for it. Joseph Kelly saw it. Job was crying out for it. And then in chapter 16 of Job, chapter 16 of the book of Job, much the same, but needs to be mentioned. Verse 21, Job 16, 21. Oh, that one might plead for a man with God as a man pleadeth for his neighbor. Why? He's looking for an advocate. He's looking for someone to plead. You know, we, we look over at 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. 1 John chapter 2, if you'd like to turn there. If not, you just relax and be a part of the ride. 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. My little children... These things write I unto you that you sin not. We need to be holy people, amen? We need to be holy people. John Persley uh, was teaching in class, and he says, you know, uh, he says, I like it when they get up and preach. Preach the gospel! He said, but I want to also see them live the gospel. We don't hear that that much. We need to live the, whole, the gospel. First Peter said, be ye holy, for I am holy. We ought to live a holy life. And then it continues. That you sin not. And if any man sin, and we all do. I love that song, uh, I was once a sinner, but I came. I love it. It's got a good beat to it. This is the American bandstand thing. A good beat to it. People can dance to it good. I like the lyrics. It's a great song. It's a charged up song. But you know what? I was once a sinner, and I still am. I'm just a saved sinner now. You say, you're bragging about your own, uh, you know, sinfulness? No, I'm not. No, I'm preaching we need to live a holy life, but I'm telling you this. We're not capable of living a perfectly holy life. We are going to sin. Well, I preached back in Maine while I was back then, preached the same way I do everywhere else. I don't know any other way to preach. But people came up and said, well, it's pretty basic stuff, you know, but hey, hey, why? You go out and tell people you're a sinner. They don't, you know, that's not exactly what we want to hear. No, the sinners are out there. Right? We're the righteous people. Wait just a minute. There are only two kinds of people, lost sinners and saved sinners. I happen to be a saved sinner by the grace of God. I'm proud of it. And I'm trying to live the very best I can. I'm just telling you, I'm not perfect. Job said this. He said, not for any injustice in mine hands. Also, my prayer is pure. Okay, good, 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 good. That's good. You know what? That was back in verse, uh, if you want to see that sometime, back in verse, uh, same chapter, chapter 16, verse 17. But you know what? He... Look, his hands might have been clean on earth. But he had a little bit of self-righteousness going right around there, didn't he? God, God had him by the throat. God broke his will. Now, Job was a better man than I'll ever be. Don't think I'm sitting here saying, hey, I'd, too bad Job wasn't like me. But Job did have a little self-righteousness. And God corrected that. But we ought to live a holy life. We are to love a holy Savior. Why? Verse 2 of chapter 1 John, chapter 2, verse 2. He's a propitiation for our sins. He's that appeasement. He's what brings us together. He's a propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Listen, his blood is sufficient. It will not pay for the sins of a man that doesn't receive him. That man will go to hell without his sins paid for, but... That blood is sufficient for all the sins of all mankind for all time. If they'll put their trust in him, there is no shortage in the power of the blood. We are to love a holy Savior, and we are to receive the propitiation, if you will, of the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is much the same as with the daysman. 
We have a daysman, a mediator, that can be our advocate and that can turn the guilty into innocent. Okay? I mean, that's better than Johnny Cochran. I may be at least the same. Listen, we're guilty. Say, so what good is a daysman if you're guilty? What good is an advocate if you're just guilty? All he can do is reduce your sentence, I guess. But our advocate can turn us from guilty into innocent by his shed blood. He paid the penalty for us. He said, you really getting all that off that tombstone? You bet. Once we open up Job, I'm seeing that Joseph Kelly is a Jobite. He's read Job. He knows Job. He knows that his Redeemer liveth. He's looking for that daysman that we can see clearly. He's looking for that advocate. We have an advocate with a Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He's all of that. He can do it all. And he can turn you from guilty to innocent on the spot. That's what we're looking for. That's what Joseph Kelly was saying to Aunt Cassie. That's what Joseph Kelly is saying to Pete Mitchell today. That's the testimony that Joseph Kelly leaves for Jerry Mitchell. And that's what Joseph Ke Kelly, being dead, yet speaketh to each of us here tonight. Those are my roots. But you're my brothers and sisters in Christ. So those are your roots, just like your roots are mine. Who would think that I would have roots in the Philippines? Amen? That's right. And we've had people that come in here from Africa that are born again in these services. Timotayo Abagunde. You wouldn't think I'd have a brother named that. President Obama probably does, but he denies it. Those are your roots. Your roots are my roots, and my roots are your roots. We have a great heritage left to us. Amen? We have an unbelievable heritage. We think, well, I got saved, I'm the only one. Wait a minute. You have an unbelievable heritage. In Christ, by God's grace, we too will leave a great heritage, not just to the saved, but also to the lost that might stumble by a graveyard someday and see, for I know that my Redeemer liveth and might ask somebody, what's that mean? And they might say, hey, he's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. You need him as your Redeemer. Praise the Lord. We've got something to say. Let me tell you. Just like it's written in stone. Just like it's written in stone. One of these days I'm going to leave this old place and leave this old body behind. I'll tell you what. We leave a testimony. They'll have some bad things to say about me. That's okay. They will not be able to deny that I'm a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that great? Isn't that great? Those are your roots. Praise the Lord for it. God, we thank you. Oh, I'm thankful to know that there are people before me that believe the same Bible I believed. Oh, they, they are reading it. They're believing it. They're telling others to believe it. To believe it, Man Warren Beale is writing things down saying this is it forever. God is to be your rule and your sovereign. He is to direct your life. Those men are in heaven today. Oh, it's going to be a joyous day to meet them. Spend time in heaven and just look back over the great history and the roots that we have. And oh God, they go back to a cross on Calvary. They go back to the Lord Jesus Christ and a holy trinity setting this world in existence. Thank you for it. God, while we're looking back, it sure is fun to know that we can look forward. I don't know how the lost world faces it. They probably put it aside. They just say, well, when you're dead, you're dead, and that's it. But that's not it. And I thank you that that truth has been revealed to Job, revealed to Joseph Kelly and Man Warren Beale, and re revealed to me, and revealed to the Pioneer Baptist Church. We praise you for it, O oh God. And thank you, and we will be praising you for all eternity. For I know that my Redeemer liveth. I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.